2 Corinthians chapter 13. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. May I preface my remarks this morning by saying that none of what I'm going to tell you is fictitious. One summer I had the opportunity of studying in the School of Religion at the University of Southern California in what is known as a Danforth Seminar. Now this is the same group that sponsors the Danforth Scholarships, which some of you top-notch seniors will soon be applying for if you're interested in careers of college teaching. This summer seminar was designed to enable teachers to analyze and strengthen their own personal faith and discover ways to enrich spiritual life on their campuses. Our group was comprised of about 25 people, 11 uh, women and 14 men representing various parts of the United States, and our religious affiliations and backgrounds were almost as varied. We were all housed in Elizabeth von Kleinschmidt Hall in very much of a co-ed environment because we were all assigned to one floor. Now, I mention this not to illustrate the great faith of the School of Religion, but, <laughs> but rather to indicate why it was possible to, for me to make the observations I did in such a short time. The chorus which produced the most drama was one entitled Christian Foundations, where we probed into the meaning of God, the nature of man, the understanding of the Christian faith, and the a study of the other great faiths of the world. Soon individual, uh, individual personalities began to reveal themselves. And by the time we were writing our long paper, which was our last assignment, entitled An Apology for Our Christian Faith, uh, all types of interesting reactions were developing. I think that perhaps the only other two people in the seminar who observed this drama were the director of the seminar, Dr. Kenneth Brown, who some of the faculty members here know, and a tall, lean theology professor from Wake Forest, North Carolina. <clears throat> First of all, there was my roommate, Ethel. Now, I've been much more sympathetic to roommate problems since Ethel. <laughs> she was an older woman, head of a biology department in a southern girls' school. I have no idea how she ever got up nerve enough to go west. And I must admit that I've been suspicious of girls' school biology ever since then, too. <laughs> Well, as roommates will, we had discussed our personal beliefs, and I have no doubt that she was a believer, but oh, so careful and so cautious. She was a perfect example of one who has not dared move out into the experiencing the joys of the Christian faith. Somehow she must have missed the biblical references to the abundant life. I thought of Ethel yesterday when Dr. Kalachi talked about life as a prison. Her first comment to me after our introductory lecture was, they say this is going to be a tough course. And when the professor began to pour it on, as we say, she became very tense and couldn't sleep. There was absolutely no time to go out for coffee with the gang, no time to relate to others. I tried to point out that this experience could be fun, stimulating, just what we needed before going back to our own schools. But she was also very stubborn. She wouldn't give an idea a chance. She was always so terribly right because, as she said, she was a Christian. Soon Ethel caught a slight cold, for which she took some very strong medicine. Somehow I sensed, even before the first feeble cough, that she would find some escape for this assignment. I think the cold was actually a combination of just a bit of Los Angeles smog and a lot of self-pity. She may have also been trying to get back at me for the night I opened the window a couple of inches without asking her permission. <laughs> really? You see, we were living in what is known as an unsafe neighborhood. Or have you heard that before? <laughs> <laughs> and 
And to Ethel, this meant sleeping with your windows closed, which is okay, but we were on sixth floor. <laughs> Well, this little cold finally put Ethel to bed so that she had to get permission from the director of the seminar to stay in Los Angeles an extra week to write her apology for her Christian faith. Then there was Dr. Blank, director of radio and television in a large Western state college. Some of my friends, best friends, are members of this church body, which has a very highly developed uh, system of works. Burl took the writing of his paper very seriously, as we all did. He became pale. He didn't eat. He couldn't sleep. And he mentioned to me several times in the dormitory that he just couldn't think of anything to write about. I have no doubt that the real spirit was at work within him that summer. Then there was Mary, my next-door neighbor, a delightful teacher of Romance languages at Queens College, New York City. She was like a child who was hearing a wonderful story for the first time. I remember her trying to read Gustav Aulain's The Faith of the Christian Church, and then she tried Nels Ferre's Faith and Reason, and decided she should rather be in Sunday school. She had never read the Bible, and the course was like opening a new world to her. The rebel of the group, and you always have to have one, came from Vermont, where he was dean of instruction in the teacher's college. I don't think he heard much, because he was so busy telling how he was emancipated from the narrow confines of any denomination, I don't know quite what this had to do with the course, but at least it kept him from thinking. <laughs> the last one I'll mention was an Episcopalian priest who was then teaching in a California junior college. For the first few days, he was a most interesting conversationalist with a dry sense of humor. I got to know him perhaps better than anyone else in the, in the workshop because we both liked White Castle hamburgers at midnight. <laughs> <clears throat> I soon sensed that he was under great tension, but I couldn't understand what was bugging him until one day in class when Dr. Ramsdale was making a comparison of Christianity and other world faiths. Bill objected very strenuously to Dr. Ramsdale's statements that to Christians, Christ had to be the only way of salvation. It wasn't long before I was listening to Bill by the hour. Here was a brilliant man, intensely interesting, urbane, but quite ineffective, because he was unwilling to come to the point where he would admit that Christ, to him as a Christian, must be all-important, not just as good as, but the only way. Bill had to drop the course. He was just not ready to write his apology. Here were men and women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, all with advanced degrees, many head of their department, all of them charged with the responsibility of guiding young people, many of them with more than the average opportunity for religion and religious training, insecure, unable to bring any kind of a vibrant Christian witness to the seminar group, and we assume to those back home. Now, some of you are in your first year at Augie, trying out your beliefs and standards for the first time away from home. Some of you are in your last year, doing things for the last time as Augie students. It's safe to assume that most of us will never again be in an environment such as this, where there are so many aids to self-examination and self-understanding, which is necessary to coming to know God and to strengthening one's faith. So this morning, I'd like to ask one simple question, the question that the great Quaker Rufus Jones puts this way. How is it with thee, thee personally? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, give each of us the courage to examine our faith and give us the power that comes from relying on thee. Strengthen our faith and help us to know the joy that comes from putting our faith into action. In Jesus' name, amen.